football and build on the W. And of course, Bobby Valentine and Bob Apodaca hoping to help Isringhausen build on a flaw that they think they detected in the Giant game, feeling that he was tipping his pitches. And we'll talk more about that as this game evolves. First, though, let's take a look at the Toronto Blue Jays lineup brought to you by four. All right, Howie Carlos Garcia, one-time Pirate, leads it off. He's at second base. He'll be followed by a John Olerud clone, Sean Green in right field. Jose Cruz Jr. in center field today. He was a center fielder in college. The middle three, Joe Carter, Carlos Delgado, and then Ed Sprague. And the bottom three, Benito Santiago, Thomas Perez, and then Pat Hinkin. And so Jason Isringhausen makes his second major league start. He made four rehab starts, at least during his second stint in the minor leagues after injuring his hand in that altercation with the Gatorade jug and suffering from tuberculosis earlier in the season. These numbers reflect his game against the Giants last week, and they're brought to you by Toyota. Yeah, once again, you can throw those numbers away that he used against the Giants or he accumulated against the Giants and go with the most important thing, the W, the win for Jason Isringhausen. And we'll see if he can go out and get another win this afternoon. Well, early on and really through most of the five innings against the Giants he didn't have command of his pitches he missed with his fastball he didn't throw a lot of breaking balls the ones that he did seem to hang more often than not so let's see how he starts off Carlos Garcia and it's the same way with a fastball well out of the strike zone. And he misses downstairs 2 and 0 to the former Pirates second baseman. Blue Jays also picked up Mariano Duncan yeah. recently from the Yankees, but he was hurt in yesterday's game. Well, Garcia has been a problem this year for the Blue Jays. They felt picking him up from the Pirates, he would really do the job. Well, he got about 80 games under his belt and didn't do it offensively or defensively, so the Blue Jays went out and got Duncan. And Isringhausen goes out and issues a four-pitch walk Heading under second, these GPU 15, energy game right time fielder, temperature Sean conditions, Green. 82 degrees. You know, I mentioned, now this next hitter, Sean Green, I mentioned a clone of John Olerud. Same type personality, very easy going, and fell into Cito Gaston's doghouse early this year, even last year. He was a right fielder. They moved Green to left field. They've moved him back to right field. During the offseason, he got contact lenses and is getting a better jump on fly balls. But it was rumored that early this year, Gaston wanted to get rid of him. Five in a row out of the strike zone by Jason Isringhausen. And after he delivered that last pitch, ball one to Sean Green, looked into the Met dugout, almost as though he were waiting for a quick visit from Bob Apodaca. One ball, one strike. I'm sure that Jason Isringhausen is still trying to overcome the butterflies that go along with pitching in the major leagues or pitching any place. If you don't have butterflies before a ball game, you're not ready for the game. He talked about not being able to harness the adrenaline which produced those mm -hmm. butterflies in the game on Wednesday against the Giants. Didn't have a real good curveball. Kind of just, it was a slop pitch on Wednesday. Good one there, one and two. The interesting thing, though, about Isringhausen as it relates to adrenaline and butterflies is that in his first major league start a couple of summers ago at Wrigley Field in Chicago he was magnificent and he had to have at least as many butterflies that night as he did on Wednesday. Now he's ahead one and two on Sean Green. And the fastball just Nick. So still one and two. Well, the Blue Jays very high on this left-hander, Sean Green. He's a kid that can play the outfield. But as I mentioned, he has John Olerud's easy-going demeanor. And that does not sit well with Cito Gaston. The guy that was very popular in Toronto. And Cito Gaston's done a nice job managing the Blue Jays. Back-to-back -back world championships. Just getting back is Garcia. Yeah, but now there are rumors circulating that with new ownership looming yeah. in Toronto and Paul Beeston, the former president of the club, now in a high-level job with Major League Baseball, that your old pal Stick Michael might end up replacing Gaston. Yeah, they feel Cito Gaston's contract will not be renewed since Paul Beeston has moved to New York, or I should say moved to the commissioner's office. Way outside, two and two. Gordon Ash, the vice president of baseball and general manager in Toronto, 
had asked Paul Beeston in the past if he could make a move as far as managerial decisions are concerned, and he was turned down by Paul Beeston. Pat Gillick also wanted to do it when he was up there, and Paul Beeston once again stopped him. Nothing but air, and Isringhausen comes back to strike out Sean Green. Well, big strike out. The first Betty one's third, always your biggest in a game like and this, and there's that off-speed pitch, and they get Green to chase it. Green's the type of guy who usually makes contact right there, swinging over the pitch. So Bob Apodaca talking about the grip on that changeup with Bobby Valentine. That's a good pitch from Jason Isringhausen. And now it's Jose Cruz, Jr., Looking at a fastball off the glove of Hundley, and by the time the book is written on Jose Cruz, not necessarily to put him in Ken Griffey's class or a player of that magnitude, but given the relatively small price the Blue Jays pay the Seattle Mariners, relievers Mike Timlin and Paul Spoljarek, this may turn out to be one of the steals of the decade. I'll tell you, baseball was shocked by the trade. So was Jose Cruz Jr. He was not happy with the trade that brought him to Toronto he called his dad Jose Cruz senior and his dad told him it might be the best thing that ever happened to you so what did the Blue Jays do they embraced Cruz they helped him get situated in Toronto and they put him in the third hole he was batting ninth for the Mariners it's a strike one and one and you know it's funny uh, you'll, you'll hear guys that are out of game say well where your bats not important it's as long as you're in the lineup well it helped Jose Cruz Jr. when they took him and put him in the third third hall and left him there. He's quite a talent. Playing center field today. He's been playing a lot of left field since joining the Blue Jays because he was a left fielder in Seattle. But at Rice University, he was a center fielder. There was no room in center field in Seattle for Cruz. Pretty good stats right there. 21 home runs. Of nope. course, Garcia Parra really doing the job. Yeah, he's a lock for the rookie of the year mm -hmm. in the American League, Garcia Parra. One and one to Cruz with one out here in the first. And that's downstairs. Two balls and a strike. You know, it's still amazing that the Mariners traded Jose Cruz Jr. away. I don't care how you look at that trade. They feel desperate to win now in Seattle. And so they were looking for the same thing most teams are looking for, and that's bullpen help. Garcia back to first base as Isringhausen stepped off. And when you get a look at Jose Cruz Jr., at least the way he wears his uniform, it sure reminds you of his dad. As soon as the umpire Steve Ripley moves out of the way, you'll see those high socks. Three and one. He looks a little bit like his dad at the plate, doesn't he? He's got he? a younger brother his dad said is going to be a better player than both of them. And we'll take a look at the Met defense backing up Jason Isringhausen. Matt Franco getting the start at third base this afternoon. Giving Edgardo Alfonso, who went hitless yesterday, the day off, even though Alfonso has been hot lately. Bobby Valentine simply looking for opportunities to give everybody a day off here and now. And so Alfonso sits today. Franco plays third. Right here, three and one to Cruz. Garcia at first with one man out. That's on the outside corner, a full count. Now here's that last pitch from Jason Isringhausen. It's a called strike. So now three and two on the tough Jose Cruz Jr. Mm. And Cruz out on strikes. So is Ringhausen after walking Garcia, falling behind Green, has struck out Green and Cruz. You gotta like it if you're Bob Apodac, a 3 2 pitch. You know you're getting a heater, and is Ringhausen beat Cruz right there. He just reared back and threw his best heater. It's amazing watching this ball club. We did the game Friday night in Baltimore. Tough loss. A lot of teams would have just folded up the tent and gone home. They came back on Saturday and Sunday, and the word resilient continues to surround this ball club. It's been quite a year for this New York Met team, surprising a lot of people. And Joe Carter for the Blue Jays goes after the first pitch and lifts it to short center. Carl Everett calls. And Jason Isringhausen out of the first inning after issuing a leadoff walk and nothing more. And here, Bobby Valentine and Bob Apodaca turned Bobby Jones into something of a delivery boy because they sent him into the video room to get some tape of earlier Isringhausen efforts. Valentine thought he discovered that 
Izzy was tipping his pitches. Yeah, in the in the uh, it looked like in a set position when they, when he bring the ball up into his glove, they felt that he was tipping the fastball and the curveball. Keep in mind, there are a lot of players who don't want to know what's coming. Now I talked to Todd Humley about that before the game, and Todd said. He doesn't like taking signs from somebody else on his team or a coach, but if he can pick up a pitch himself, he'll take it. You saw that smile on Bobby Jones's face. He was glad to be able to simply sit and enjoy the inning on the bench mm -hmm. without having to make any runs to the video store. I think it's a great idea, especially let the pitcher, let another pitcher, an intelligent pitcher, go in and take a look at the video tape. Thought you only figured catchers <laughs> no. were intelligent. You know, you're right. At least that's the propaganda I've been hearing mm. for two years. I forgot. <laughs> so there's the American League Cy Young Award winner, Pat Henkid, who pitches to Carl Everett leading off for New York, and the fastball misses away. Everett particularly glad that August is over. Only a 197 average with one home run during the month of August. <laughs> and he's hit just 207 since the All-Star break. Now, Benito Santiago was doing the catching today for the Blue Jays. Charlie O'Brien was Henkin's private catcher last year. Now Hinkin get off to a tough start, lost a few ball games. Charlie O'Brien, a couple years back, he ended up catching Greg Maddox when he won two Cy Young Awards. He caught Pat Hinkin last year when he won the Cy Young Award. So what does Charlie O'Brien do when a pitcher starts getting hit and losing ball games? Goes to Roger Clemens. <laughs> He'll be catching tomorrow. He'll catch Roger Clemens. Well, with no disrespect meant to Pat Hinkin, Charlie O simply moved up the ladder yes, as he did. Clemens is having a year about as good as any other in his tremendous career and Henkin will need now to win all six of his remaining starts to win 20 for the second straight year. You Which, know no you, pitcher in Toronto history has done that. You notice when Charlie O'Brien was with the Nets and Doc Gooden was throwing the ball very well. Charlie was attached to Doc's hip. Full count to Everett. He was catchy Doc. <laughs> I have a feeling Charlie O'Brien's going to make a manager someday. Oh yes, yeah, he'll do a good job as a manager. He's a he's a good receiver too. It'll be a payoff pitch to Everett, and they'll have to do it all over again. You know, it's funny uh, when, when you look at Benito Santiago. We used to talk, and everybody talked about and wrote about how this guy could throw. He would throw from his knees, and he, he was an exciting catcher. Pitchers don't like that. They like a quiet catcher. Guys like yourself, how he liked those effervescent. Those animated catchers. Yeah, they just don't like those catchers stealing the spotlight. Everybody talks about Santiago because of his unconventional methods. Right at Carlos Garcia, and there's one man out here in the Mets first. Carl Everett makes the first out. He'll be followed by Matt Franco and then Adding John Olerud. The middle three, Todd Third Hundley, Matt Bernard Franco. Gilkey, and Carlos Baerga. And the bottom three, Butch Husky, Ray Ordonez, and then Jason Isringhausen. And you're looking at a guy who finishes many of the games that he starts, and that's something of an aberration in this era. Pat Henkin with a total this year of nine complete games. Roger Clemens, by the way, has eight. Henkin, the workhorse in the American League. He leads the league in innings pitched with 226. And Matt Franco takes a high rider for ball one. Well, we talked about Henkin having a lot of pitches. His out pitches his fastball. He's got an overpowering fastball. They say when he starts to struggle, he pulls his hat down. And for some reason, that's the symbol that he's taking his baby seriously. And then he gets it together. 2-0 to the Mets third baseman. Henkin, his last time out, got the first 12 Chicago White Sox batters in order. And in fact, the White Sox didn't hit a ball out of the infield against Henkin until Albert Bell let off with a single in the fifth inning. And that's hit to the left side. Joe Carter hustling in for the second out. Yeah, Joe Carter looked like he got a bad jump on the ball, but was able to come in and make the grab. Carter playing Ready left third. field today. Five, Played a lot of first base, first too, base but in the future for the Blue Jays, that position will probably go full time to Carlos Delgado. Here's that last play. You see where Carter it looked like he broke back a little, then he hustled in and made the grab. Yeah, Carlos Delgado was, as you mentioned, Moving on and off first base along with Joe Carter and Cito Gaston wanted to platoon him. Gordon Ash, a general manager, wants Delgado in the lineup at all times because they feel he's going to be a superstar. Delgado was a catcher when he came up, but he has a congenital problem with a, the bones in his arm. 
So they moved him to first base because he was having trouble throwing the ball. So Carlos Delgado now playing first base. This guy played first base last year for the Blue Jays. And John Olerud, who heard the words earlier this year from the GM of the Blue Jays, Gord Ash, just wait until the National League fielders learn how to defend him. All of a sudden, that average will plummet. Well, he comes into this game hitting a very respectable 290, but he's slumping with only two hits in his last 30 at bats. He was extremely popular in Toronto. In fact, Rich Griffin, who was a columnist for the Toronto paper, told me if he wrote a column and he was critical of John Olerud, he said it was amazing the letters he would get saying, how can you criticize this young man? He's such a good person. He said it was from moms and grandmoms. <laughs> two balls, two strikes on John Olerud. And Cito Gaston somewhat critical of the fact that Olerud never learned to really hit for power, and that seemed somewhat ill-advised that Garth, that um, Cito and Willie Upshaw was his batting coach wanted to turn Olerud into something that he is naturally not. Here's that line drive the other way, but it's foul. We've seen a lot of that from Olerud. Let's look at the Blue Jays defensively, brought to you by the new Dodge. There's Delgado at first, Garcia. Thomas Perez, the shortstop. Ed Sprague struggling through a difficult year at third. Carter Cruz and Sean Green in the outfield. Santiago catches Henkin. And even with going back to his original batting stroke, he still has 16 homers and 78 RBIs with a month to go. I think once they traded him away, it had to be justified. And the breaking ball, now a full count. You know, it's funny. Cito Gaston didn't like it that John Olerud wasn't intense. Now you get another team, and the guy's real intense, and they say, let's get rid of him. He's too intense. So a payoff pitch to Olerud. And it's laced to left. Water over, but again, a foul ball. It almost looks like John Oliver is trying to hit the ball left field just to upset Cito Gaston. He wants it to fall in, though. <laughs> and that is what Olerud generally does when he's going well. Hit the ball with authority the other way. Well, he's in his walk year of his contract. See a little hitch, the hands going back. It's a nice swing. Just a little bit late on that fastball. See the hands go back, now the head goes down. It's a good swing, just a little late. Going to be a glut of free agents on the market this winter because a lot of teams will refrain from negotiating and signing their players to save room on the expansion draft protection list. The way Blue Jays shifted for all of them. And that's it well to left. And Carter on the warning track. So all the routes seem to be on a mission to hit it well the other way. He <laughs> did. Here since the beginning. We love you, big guy. Get well quickly and terrific guys. Consistently upbeat. He's a fixture. And we need him back here as soon as possible. Get, get well quick, Art. So we go to the second inning. Carlos Delgado, Ed Sprague, and Benito Santiago for the Blue Jays. Not the Blue Jays' first appearance here at Shea Stadium, although you might think otherwise, but back in 1981, there was a baseball strike. Good breaking ball that, there from Isinghouse. That's his, that's his good curveball right there. Mm. That's what got him to the big leagues. That's what got the baseball critics, or I should say baseball evaluators, to love him. Ooh. And that's pounded a fair ball. Nice play by Olaru. What a circle around that one. And once again, Isringhausen broke that ball off. That was a sharp break. We only saw one or two of those pitches the other day. He threw two in this at bat. Six. This ball ended up. Here's that curveball again. Now, it's it's bell tie, but still it had that good break on it. And this is a nice play by Olerud. He wants to impress Cito Gaston once again. There's is he breaking off the mound over to first base? And as I mentioned, nice play by John Olerud. You know, I talked about. We were in Baltimore talking about baseball. I used the word critics, baseball evaluators, and how Cal Ripken played every day despite some of the evaluators saying he shouldn't. Well, John Olerud trying to show Cito Gaston, who evaluated his talent, that he's a much better player. And you know, guys downplay. They say, no, nah, it doesn't matter to me. It matters. It matters a lot. 
And I'm sure it matters to Cito Gaston that he's right in his evaluation. That's fouled back one and two to Ed Sprague who's had a rough time of it this year. Has not been as productive as the Blue Jays expected. But he plays every day, literally, although he did leave the game on Friday against the Florida Marlins with a subluxation in his right shoulder. Well, this is his 222nd consecutive game. His dad had good stuff. He was a, he was a pitcher. At Sprague Senior. Hey, speaking of seniors and juniors, in Cincinnati today, Pete Rose Jr. has finally hit the big leagues. He's playing third base at, we'll still call it Riverfront Stadium, where his dad used to set up shop. And Petey, as his dad called him, struck out his first major league at bat. Nine years in the minor leagues. I'll say one thing. He takes after his dad because nine years is a long time in the minor leagues, and he kept fighting and fighting to get back to get up into the major leagues. There's the product of another father-son combination. Mm -hmm. Reminds you of his dad also. Strong, durable. You know, he won three good guy awards during the offseason. He deserved them. I guess I got to clean that up grammatically. I don't like to leave anything hanging. I mean, he's not a product of the combination, per se. He's a product of his mom and dad. And with his dad, forms major league combination. I'm glad you cleaned that up. Well, school starts this week. I don't want to get any teachers mad at me. <laughs> Still a full count on Ed Sprague. We mentioned before the Blue Jays were here at Shea in 1981. Just as teams <laughs> were getting ready to come back from the baseball strike, played an exhibition here at Shea Stadium. So if you think they've never been here before, you're wrong. And that's outside ball four. For some our injury report today, the GHI injury report 18, centers on Benito Armando Santiago. Reynoso. Tough break for the right hander. Two hours of surgery last Thursday. You need shoulder surgery. Invariably, you end up going down to Alabama to see Dr. Andrews. Mm -hmm. So now it's Benito Santiago with a runner on first and one out in a scoreless game here in the second. Used to be in baseball when a pitcher had elbow trouble that they weren't as concerned as shoulder. Of course with the way medical science has evolved you can fix that shoulder brand new too. Better than new. As he knows all about it he had a tear in his shoulder last year bone chips in the elbow too. And that's popped up to the infield by Santiago. Ordonez out, waves off Gilkey. And there are two men away. Well, we've seen some Betty good Hayes, stuff from Izzy. One. Although, Shortstop, in order Thomas to be Perez. successful in the big leagues, when you throw 29 pitches, you have to be better than 15 and 14 as far as strikes and balls are concerned. But he has shown a better curveball today. Sharper break. I thought his curveball the other day was a result of his butterflies. It was a nervous curveball. Didn't have that sharp, sharp break to it. Thomas Perez, the shortstop, called up a couple of weeks ago from Syracuse. He's here because Alex Gonzalez went on the disabled list with a fractured finger. Perez, native of Venezuela. Two and zero now to Perez. It's Sprague, the runner at first with two out. There's the spy cam brought to you by Chase. Trying to focus on that curveball. But the fastball rides high, and so Isringhausen behind three and nothing with the pitcher Pat Henkin on deck. That's a strike three and one. Juan Acevedo will be on that very mound tomorrow night as a starting pitcher for New York against Roger Clemens for the Blue Jays. We'll have it for you. 
That's a strike. So now the count full, and with two outs, that means an automatic start for the base runner Sprague at first. Perez has struggled with the bat all year. So when you're pitching to Perez, you're pitching to a hitter who is not that much more proficient than a pitcher. You like to get the pitcher to lead off next inning. And a little looper, Ordonez oh. can't come up with it. Ordonez broke back. We've seen a couple of uh, defensive players immediately break back on contact and then have to come in. And right there, Betting nine. that's a break Number for 41. Perez. Pitcher and a bad break for Kitten. the Mets. Watch Ordonez. We'll see if we can see him on this replay. Ball hit weakly in the air. How about this baby falling in? Oh, you see Ordonez broke back and then struggled to come back in and the ball takes a that's when you're hitting in good luck right here look at this what a backspin backspin where Donia's broke back that he slipped if he didn't slip he still might have caught that ball so with two out Pat Henkin will take his turn at bat somewhat aberrational for him as with all American League pitchers this year he's 0 for 5 with a bat in his hand But Henkin as a pitcher leads the American League with three shutouts and nine complete games. <laughs> Nothing in two. If he throws another pitch like that, this inning is over. It's going to be that sharp breaking curveball. Think about it. Henkin rarely hits. Outfield very shallow. And the 0-2. Now Hundley has to do a little goal teddy. The Hank can see a couple of breaking balls. One a dandy. One a 59 footer. And we'll see what Isringhausen does this time on one and two. Carl Everett very shallow in center field. Same for Butch Husky in right. That's almost a little legal line. So they used to line up against me. And Henkin called out on strikes. Third strikeout for Isringhausen. And in the middle of the second here at Shea. The... And Henkin's first pitch, a fastball right there. Not only has he slumped recently, but throughout August had one of the lowest batting averages of any regular in the National League. During August, he hit just a buck 95. So you saw the average for the season now down to 265. Good power numbers, though 28 homers, 80 RBIs. And he was behind that fastball. Well, you know, there's a lot made of what Bobby Valentine said about not getting sleep. Well, it's true that Todd needed some rest because of the rigors of catching. No doubt about it, and he has struggled in the month of August. And the guy who's starting to come on now is the man on deck, Bernard Gilkey. And it's in there for a call third strike. Todd thought it was low. Steve Ripley didn't. Now you see, you, you don't go. 233. And still with a month ago, a month to go, there's time to get the numbers to a much more respectable level. Than Bernard had seen throughout most of the first four and a half months. Yeah, over his six game hitting streak, he's been on fire. And of course, the big thing now is for the Mets to get closer to those red hot Florida Marlins. Blue Jays didn't help the Mets at all this weekend as Florida took three from Toronto. And so the Mets start today seven behind the Marlins for the wild card. Keep in mind, if the Mets can get a little closer, They've got four games remaining in Miami later this month. Two and two now to Gilkey. In fact, it was funny in the press from some of the members of the traveling group of Blue Jays who followed the Blue Jays were talking about that four game series that will take place against the Marlins with the Mets. And the two two to Gilkey swung on and missed. So Henkin starting strong has retired the first five Mets both of them here in the second via the strikeout. Well last year he won the Cy Young Award. Struggled a little bit this year but still has that good stuff through the fastball by Gilkey. Good location on that fastball. And he threw the fastball for strike three to Todd Hundley. So what's his strikeout pitch. The fastball. 
So Gilkey retired. Carlos Baerga will be the batter. And that's hit hard by Baerga towards the right field corner. The carom played by Green and Baerga probably didn't need to do that. But it's a two base hit the first for New York Boy, he jumped on that heater. He scorched that ball in the right field. Ball exploded off Carlos Baerga's bat. Good bat speed. Watch this. Boom. Ball was out over the heart of the plate and Baerga tattooed that ball short hopping the wall. Hey, Fran, I got a story. I got a question for you. Okay. Pete Rose Jr. picked up his first major league hit this afternoon and his second at bat. Now, I'm just thinking of this off the top of my head. Do the Roses, Pete's senior and junior, now hold the major league combined record for hits by a father's yeah. son? 4192 for they senior, must. one for junior. They must. Well, that's, that's great for the Cincinnati Reds and Pete Rose, Pete Rose Jr. You have to admire, we mentioned it earlier, somebody that stayed with it for nine years. Foul oh. straight back by Husky. I mean, how many hits? Oh, I don't know. I have no idea off the top of my head. We'll have to look it up. Say Gus and Buddy Bell. Bob and Ray yeah. Boone. Yeah, they probably don't. Gus and Buddy, that'd be interesting. What, yeah. about 3,000 hits between them, you think? Yeah. Well, I'll tell you one thing, though. Pete Rose, that's why it just doesn't make sense. I mean, he's... Not in the Hall of Fame, and yet he's got more hits than anybody in the game. Of course, what he did, whatever they found out that he did, they kept him out. The 0 1 to Husky, and that's fouled off the screen. So Butch, with hits in his last nine consecutive games, building the average to a season, or at least a recent high, 282. He was at 290 at one point in July. Added in a three game series in Baltimore, 308 against those Orioles. Bayerga in scoring position with two out. No score here in the second. And Henkin deals. And the breaking ball gets Husky. So, surrounding the double by Bayerga, Henkin strikes out the side. Score. Tri state area. Still summertime, no matter what they say. That adage about summer ending on Labor Day, that's a lot of nonsense. Carlos Garcia leads off and takes a ball. There is usually a plethora of summer-like weather in September. And after all, it is summer until about the 21st of the month. People love to speak in absolutes. Mm -hmm. All right, so the Griffies we understand, and this certainly would have been the first father-son combination I think worth researching after having time to think about it a little bit the Griffies Ken senior and junior have combined now for what about 3,500 hits and the bonds 3,600 Barry and Bobby bonds that means the Griffies are gonna probably own this thing by the time it's over wait a minute what about those brothers who smothers brothers yeah how do they do Ray Ordonez <laughs> Throws out Garcia, one out in the third. Because we're going father son. How about Sisler? Dick and George. Right fielder Sean Green. <laughs> the brothers. You, you got to give me a little help. That's what we're. How about those brothers? All right. Who? We're talking father son here. <laughs> and I and get the, the brothers. Yeah. Well, it's still early in the day. Well, if the Griffies have 3,500 between them, then by the time Ken's through, he certainly should get over that 4,200 hit mark. 4,193 now, the combination of Pete Rose Sr. and Pete Rose Jr., who added his first to the big leagues today. What oh, Yogi and Dale. Well, he had, Yogi played in over 2,000 games. Let me figure he had about 21, 2,200 hits. Must have. Gonna throw some in there for luck. One and one to Sean Green. Sean Green was offered a baseball scholarship at Stanford, but chose to sign instead with the Toronto Blue Jays. Was drafted 16th overall on the first round in 1991. John Olerud told me he follows. Sean Green closely watches his career unfold. They were good friends when he was in Toronto. We 
you talked about the same type of personality, the same place in the doghouse. Slowly hit. And again, Isringhausen has to cover the bag. Two men away. So far, Isringhausen look, has looked very relaxed and comfortable in that mound. It's a good sign for the Mets. He's showing that good breaking curveball, the sharp break. Both two out of nobody on as he goes to work against Jose Cruz Jr. And that's a strike, nothing in one. It's amazing. This guy's got 21 home runs. His dad, an outstanding hitter, now the first base coach with the Houston Astros, for whom he played most of his major league career. A spray hitter, moved the ball around. You look at this guy, you would say he's going to be a spray hitter, but he's hitting with thunder and another good breaking yeah. ball and here's your storyline so far he has the number two today he yeah. didn't on Wednesday that's right when he has this pitch here he's as good as anybody in baseball well, that's a good sharp break stays in the strike zone one and two Gus and Buddy Bell have the record how about that they did have that many, huh? Mm -hmm. Gus and Buddy Bell combined for 43-37. I didn't really? realize they had that many. Uh, Gabe Paul once told me he, he considered Gus Bell as good as anybody in the game when he was a general manager. And I know Buddy Bell was an outstanding third baseman and a good hitter. Two balls, two strikes. So the pressure's on Pete. Let's see. What What'd you say? The, the Bell brothers or father and son? 43-37. 41-93 now for the Roses. And so... Pete Jr.'s got to come up with 140 odd hits somewhere. Nothing but air. And for the second time today, Jose Cruz Jr. is out on strikes. Four K's for Izzy. And in the middle of the third at Shea, no score. Mario Levy of Plainview, the GHI health insurance broker of the day. Contact a GHI broker for all your health insurance needs. 1-0 to Ray Ordonez. Ordonez five hits in his last 19 trips. Trying to help build something here in the last of the third against Pat Henkin. And the fastball taken the other way. That's Sean Green's neighborhood. So one out in the Mets third and Isringhausen will hit. Well, he talked about Isringhausen and having his good stuff. So does Pat Hinkin. Batting nine, number Getting that fastball Pitcher and all of his Jason other pitches over the plate when he needs it. He rears back and fires the ball. Last inning, he struck out Humley in a fastball. Bernard Gilkey in a fastball. Gave up a hard double to Carlos Baerga and then struck out Butch Husky on a curveball. And the fastball for a strike, nothing in one. The Blue Jays are averaging a little bit over 30,000 a game in Toronto, but they used to average around 50,000 a game, and they say the baseball strike really hurt that franchise. <laughs> On the outside corner, row and two. In fact, one person traveling with the Blue Jays said it's now back to being a hockey town. Well, I think the timing of the strike as it pertained to the beginning of the decline of the Blue Jays had a lot to do with it, too. And the breaking ball gets Isringhausen. Four strikeouts for Henkin. And the Jays won the World Series in 92 and 93. They were not going to go to the postseason in 94 in all likelihood. And then they continued their decline to the point where also now Sky Dome, which is where they play, is not the novelty attraction that it was when it opened in the late 80s. In fact, they said after winning the World Championship for the second time, players were coming off the podium, and because of baseball laws, some of them were being told as they left the podium, you're no longer Blue Jay. Because they had to be told within a certain period of time. So they would then go from the podium into the general manager's office and he would say, you know, we appreciate everything you've done, but right now you're no longer a Blue Jay. Boy, that's a tough part of baseball, isn't it? Well, a lot of players are going to find out and continue to find out, not only this winter because of expansion. Carl Everett loops one. Ooh. And cutting in front of the shortstop Perez was the second baseman Garcia. 
And so the Mike Garcia, the second baseman, moving in front of the shortstop Perez, right? Now look a little closer. And it was the shortstop Perez who wound up making the play. It looked like Garcia made contact with this ball. So now you're angling for an assist on his behalf. No, no. You know what? I'm going to say right from the get-go, I thought the shortstop caught that ball. Joe Carter hits one way up into the air to the shortstop side. And Ray Ordonez has it for the first out. So Carter has seen two pitches this afternoon. Fly ball to center and now pop to Ordonez. You know, it's funny talking about Joe Carter. Uh, when Joe Carter uh, in his prime was hitting home runs, if you watch highlights late at night, Joe Carter hit more low fastballs over the wall in Toronto. It was incredible how he liked that low fastball. But getting back to that play, Howie, I would like to stay with you when it, in times of trouble. Now, you can bail. No foxhole. We know, we know we'll <laughs> find you in the foxhole when necessary. <laughs> no, I, I, thought, I thought the second baser caught the ball, too. All four of my eyes are going on me <laughs> at once. So here's Delgado. Boy, I remember when he came up to the major leagues as a catcher and everybody thought he was a can't miss. He started hitting balls off the restaurant in the Sky Dome up there in Toronto. And then the next thing you know, he was back in the minor leagues. Oh, and two to Delgado. Well, they talked about his potential for a while to the point where they were starting to get a little nervous as to whether or not he'd ever cash in and thankfully he has. Well we talked about it earlier this season Cito Gaston wanted to platoon him with Joe Carter. Where Nash the general manager didn't want that to happen so now Delgado is playing every day. Still 0 and 2. He's got 28 home runs. He's going to end up driving in I guess 100 runs. He's got, uh, he's got 82 now. And off to a great start last year. Had a good April. He drove in 26 runs. Beck, he hit 333 with six home runs the first month of last season. Wound up hitting 270. And the breaking ball, pop foul. Wasn't Labor Day years ago always a doubleheader? Oh, there were a lot of dates years ago that used to be doubleheaders. All the big holidays, Sundays as a rule. I and mean, I think people back then enjoyed doubleheaders. I don't think I don't think they're ready for doubleheaders anymore. Nothing in two on Carlos Delgado with one out. Of course, circumstances have changed. And that's it in the air to right field. Butch Husky right there for the second out. Well, don't forget, Roger Clemens will look for his 21st win for the Blue Jays tomorrow. His first appearance here at Shea since game six, 1986. He has a good fastball. He has a split finger. There's a split finger to Mo Vaughn. He struck him out. He's found a new home in Toronto. We'll have that for you right here on Sports Channel. You know, doubleheaders certainly are and were a nice concept, but things have changed dramatically, as everybody knows, with regard to the way the business of baseball has evolved so that with the price of doing business today at the ownership level it's just it's not cost effective or efficient on their part to basically give away a game and I mean that's what a doubleheader comes down to more so now than ever when you're paying these guys the money you're paying them yep. you got to at least have the opportunity you know it hurts people sometimes to realize that to make some of that money back oh yeah you, you can't play doubleheaders you just saw by the way an outstanding curveball again from Jason Isringhausen. And the one two to spray. So is Ringhausen who has retired his last six in succession trying to close out the fourth inning. It's also tough. I don't know if it's tougher today than ever before but it's tough to win a doubleheader. So if you're in a pennant race in September you don't want to be involved in a doubleheader. Next will be involved in a doubleheader two weeks from today. That'll be a twinite doubleheader in Philadelphia. Necessitated by the rain out back in May.
Philadelphia has been playing some decent baseball lately. They knocked out Irabu in three innings. They get a five nothing lead over the Yankees. They're in the sixth inning there at the vet. But Scott Rowland the other day after Nomo hit him for the third time this year after the game went down to the Dodger clubhouse called him out and said no more. No more no more. And it's off the outside corner. So Isringhausen loses Sprague as his third walk of the afternoon. And Benito Santiago will be next. Second time Sprague has walked. Catcher Benito Santiago. That's a lot tidier portrait than was painted on Wednesday here at Shea Stadium against San Francisco. They think the world of them, especially Bob Apodaca, the pitching coach with the Mets. And that's on the outside corner to Santiago. First time we got a chance on Sports Channel to see Isringhausen was during the strike year. We did some minor league games, saw him pitch for Binghamton. They were very, very high on him back then. He and Wilson and Pulsifer will have a chance to build up some innings winter ball this year with time before spring training and a nice play by Todd Hundley one and one to Santiago overthrowing that curveball right now I think the most difficult pitch to control consistently is the overhand curveball saw Isringhausen throw some nasty pitches in the strike zone right there he bounced the hook. That's why Sandy Koufax was something else. For about six years got it over the plate every single time he went out there. Weekly hit and by Erga throws out Santiago the side retired. So Jason Isringhausen's only allowed one hit through the first four, but he'll need some help offensively. No score. Treated to a pitcher's duel between Pat Enkin and Jason Isringhausen. Now, Howie Rose likes to kid me that everywhere we go in America, I'm always grabbing something to eat. Well, that's the case again this afternoon. But you come to New York, back to the Shea Stadium, and you come out into the outfield, you got to have a good New York meal. So, Howie, forget about the crab cakes, forget about the Rocky Mountain oysters. I got myself a good old New York dog here. And, of course, you can't get a knish anywhere but at Shea Stadium. A little mustard dip. Now, that's New York, fellas. Oh, well, you know, the thing with Matty is it's always for free. That's why we're <laughs> getting him. As Matt Franco takes a strike on the outside corner to start the fourth. I paid for this. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> okay, show us the receipts. $4.75 for the dog in the Kanish. Well, and a bouncing ball took a bad hop, but Delgado stayed with it. And Franco retired, one away. That's a bargain here when you compare with what's going on across the street. Well, you get, that, that's a great place to go over and buy a little ice cream. Yeah, attractive interest rates this <laughs> year on the hot dogs and knishes at the tennis matches. That's a nice play right there by Delgado. Quick hands. You have to have quick hands to play in the big leagues, not only as a hitter, but also as a defensive player and also as a fan. When you're chewing like that man right there, you have to have quick hands and a quick mouth. Of course, that's his third one in the last 10 minutes. John Olerud hits one deep to right field. You can forget it. Off the scoreboard, and did he love that one? Not Cito, but John Olerud, who delivers the message to Gaston. It's one to nothing, New York. Well, he pulled that one just like Cito wanted once upon a time. And for Olerud, Number 17 is 79th RBI. Maybe as tasty as any that he's had this year. Hmm. 1 0 to Todd Hundley. And you know, we talked about it earlier. When you're traded away, that baseball evaluator says, You can't play for me. And what did Olerud do? He said, yes, I can. That's why it's important. I mean, 
you have to have respect for the people evaluating you, but also you got to be able to disagree with them. And John Olerud showing Cito Gasson right there for this moment at least, you're wrong. That's tough in baseball, boy. You have somebody, especially guys, you know, manager, coaches, front office, they evaluate you. They know the game. They told John Olerud you're not going to be able to do it, and he did it. And it's hit deep to right center by Hundley. Green to the warning track with company. Mm. And it's Cruz who came away with it. Two men away. Well, this is apropos. It's a payback. It's our Discover card. Payback, playback. And this is payback from John Olerud to Cito Gaston. Said I couldn't do it. I did it. He watch where, that watch where it hits. Oh, he hammered that baseball. That are the balls that Strawberry used to hit over minutes. there. So Olerud, he knew it was gone. He dropped his head. He knew it was gone. Savor the moment. 1 0 to Bernard Gilkey. No official word yet, but that's about a 400 foot ride for that baseball. 1 and 1 now to Gilkey, who struck out back in the second inning. Made John Olerud happy, and I'm sure Cito Gaston a little bit on the eye. Oh, how about that? Tipped his cap. How about that? Now, that's a class act. If he tipped his cap to John Olerud, that's class. He said, see, I told you you could do that if you wanted to. <laughs> well, if he tipped his cap to John o Olerud, that's a class act by Cito Gaston. Of course, Cito will say, well, it was Upshaw that wanted you to become more of a full <laughs> hitter and never mind go the other way. One to nothing New York with two outs nobody on here in the home four. And that's sliced towards the right field line green hustling over. And he puts it away in foul territory. So John Olerud delivered a rather emphatic message to his former teammates. Thanks to that the Mets have a one nothing lead. Gaston Willie Upshaw and Blue Jays management. Yeah, and uh, Olerud hit the home run. It looked to us like Cito Gaston tipped his hat to John Olerud when he was sitting in the Mets dugout. You know, it's funny. You want to show the manager that told you you couldn't play. You wanted to show him, yes, I can. He just felt he didn't hit the home runs, and he hit one here, 425 feet. Got the hands out there, and he knew it was gone. And you know, I wonder, Sean Green, who's been in and out of Cito Gaston's doghouse from what I understand for the same reasons that John Olerud was in and out of the doghouse if for just a brief moment under his breath Sean Green said Cito take that <laughs> well I <laughs> you one thing Sean Green never hit 363 at least no. he hasn't yet John Olerud did back in 1993 when the Blue Jays won their second consecutive World Series. That was our discovered card payback playback and how about Cito Gaston tipping his cap. Class act. His way of saying it was up Sean that wanted you. <laughs> I, I had nothing to do with it. <laughs> so something about the afternoon that agrees with Thomas Perez. Perez hurt his wrist last weekend in Kansas City. Blue Jays thought he might have broken it or torn ligaments. But he's been able to hang in and play through it. Two balls, two strikes right. on Thomas Perez. Right there, uh, Todd Huntley went out and blocked that ball. I'm sure, you know, somebody might be saying, why would he do it with nobody on base? There were two strikes on the hitter, especially catching a curveball pitcher. You might get somebody swinging at that ball down in the dirt. you got to keep it. In front of you, and you saw Todd Huntley make contact with his glove, and kept the ball in front of him. And a spy cam look at the 2 2, a foul ball. You know, it's funny, I talked about the evaluators in baseball when they evaluate a player and they say you can't do it. As a player, you you know, you can't listen to him, you got to go out and believe in yourself. But Willie McCovey also told me you got to be careful about somebody that says you can do this. Off the hands, Bayerga drifts back, and there's one man out. McCovey referred to if, if you're having a nice day and you pick up the paper the next day and you read it and you start believing it, 
He said an open four is right around the corner. So it's a delicate balance. I'll tell you what else is right around the corner here at Shea Stadium. A nifty promotion coming up on Friday night, the 12th of September, when the Montreal Expos come in. Downstairs to Pat Henkin. It's going to be Flaming Pie Night here at Shea Stadium with Paul McCartney's new CD taking center stage. A lot of great giveaways. One and one to Henkin, including some authentically and recently signed CDs by Paul McCartney himself. He's my favorite entertainer. And I love those Beatles. I've brainwashed you. That's right. When he said, you know what, he could, that song, uh, with a little luck. Yeah, 1978, yeah. With a little luck. That's right. You were with a team that year that came back to win and needed some luck to do it. Yeah, all talent. Backing up as Franco makes a nice pick and put a circle around that one. That's our learning channel replay. Snow coned by Matt Franco. You got to have those quick hands to play this game and look at the quick hands. Boom, the ball comes up. Franco gloves it and across the infield it goes with a little luck. A two out, nobody on. Carlos Garcia will be the batter. And on the 12th, they'll be giving away a lot of McCartney related items, including a big trip to London. Look at that. Once again, with a little luck. Flips it across the infield. Now, the other thing is I that the only McCartney song you can name, and that's oh, why no, you're going to no, stay no, on that theme? No, I think it pertains to baseball. I like to stay in the context we're in. What I happened think. to skill? <laughs> Luck's more important. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and one to Garcia. By the way, September 14th, big day here at Shea Stadium. One of the most popular players in the history of Mets baseball will be inducted into the Mets Hall of Fame, and nobody did it better. I talked to Davey Johnson in Baltimore. He talked about Keith Hernandez, just a special player, and he's going into the Mets Hall of Fame. It'll be on Sunday the 14th. So Paul McCartney flaming pie night on the 12th. And Keith Hernandez inducted into the Mets Hall of Fame on the 14th. You like that flaming pie stuff. Best album he's done in years. Mm -hmm. Outstanding. I can tell you on some specific songs if you like. Breaking Ball one and two. You know, as time goes as time goes along, I, I, I would take some input. Some days, the name of the song on Flaming Pie is pretty as anything he's done with or without the Beatles. Mm, keep that yeah. in your mind. I'll keep it there. And it's on the outside corner for a call third strike. Five strikeouts for Jason Isringhausen. He's allowed only one hit through five. It's the, well, we're going to talk about this in the dugout. We get Jason Isringhausen cruising along, but we want to remind you it's the bottom of the fifth inning. A great time to enjoy a frost brood. Coors Light, grab a silver bullet and let the mountains come to you. Coors Light, tap the rocket. Hunley talking. With great animation in that dugout to Jason Isringhausen, who has shown a good fastball, a good curveball this afternoon. Allowed just one hit through five with five strikeouts. He's walked three. Bayerga has the only Met hit other than Olerud's home run. A very well struck double to right in the second inning. Yeah, that ball jumped off Bayerga's bat and short hopped the wall. How about the let's go Met chant? Garcia throws Bayerga out, one gone in the fifth. Of course, you expect to hear let's go Mets here, but they had a pretty hefty contingent of mm -hmm. Mets fans at Camden Yards over the weekend. And it was funny because on Friday night early in the game, the Oriole fans tried to drown it out. They did a nice job, but late in the game, the Oriole fans went home, and the Mets fans continued on. Nice to see a new stadium similar to Camden Yards here in Flushing someday. Well, that's the hope over the next few years. I tell you, you get jealous big time when you go to these new ballparks, but some of the others will have to go a long way to match up to Camden Yards in Baltimore as Butch Husky takes ball one. Now, we haven't been to Jacobs Field in Cleveland or the ballpark at Arlington. Coors Field, for example, is nice. So is Turner Field in Atlanta, but by Camden Yard. Deep to left by Husky. And that's a gunner. Two to nothing, New York.
How about the big fella? 18 home runs on the year now. So the Mets have gone deep twice now against Pat Henkin, who has allowed 27 home runs on the year. Ordonia's with a slow roller, thrown out by Perez. Only Alan Watson and Bobby Witt, who have allowed 29 and 28 respectively, have given up more than Henkin. And here's number 27. And you see that high fastball. And Husky got around on it, hit it over the left field wall. Hit like a bullet over that 358 mark. So big Butch Husky with home run number 18. And Jason Isringhausen can stuff another run into his wallet. As Izzy comes to bat for the second time against Pat Henkin. In the hole, long throw for Perez. And he got it there, barely. So Isringhausen will take a quick breather, but he has a little extra support as Butch Husky hits number 18 and on the Model scoreboard at the end of five, two to nothing. New York people on hand for this ball game. Jason Isringhausen doing the job this afternoon. He has that sharp breaking curveball and compare those stats to the other day. Same man, same uniform, different results, dramatically different results. Better curveball today. That's why the results are different. Better fastball, better location, throwing strikes. Sean Green struck out in the first inning and bounced to first. No balls and a strike on Green. If there was any concern about Isringhausen tipping his pitches on Wednesday. There should be none today. Of course, they were concerned only with men on base. Yeah, he was in a set position. And they were concerned that he was tipping them the way he was going to the set position. One was quicker than the other. Only four base runners for the Jays so far through the first five. The only time they threatened it was very mild in the second with two on and two out. But the pitcher, Pat Henkin, struck out. So Bobby Valentine has to feel a lot better about the guy that could ultimately evolve into still what was planned for him, the ace of the staff, or at least one of them. Oh, what a lift this would be to this ball club if he stays healthy and has a nice September. I like Bill Pulsifer's attitude. He's fighting like mad to get back to the big leagues. And the one two to Green just fouled off. And take a look at Izzy's numbers right now. 90 pitches. He's thrown 57 strikes, 33 balls. And he improved the ratio since the first couple innings. There you go. You, once you get comfortable, you start shaking off the catcher. That's high, two and two. As for whether or not more help comes for Bob Apodaca and his pitching staff, or really any place else on the roster, at least from Norfolk. That'll be decided later on today. See how the tides do in their final game. Fouled back. Norfolk just a half game behind Charlotte for the International League's final playoff berth. And they'll both play their final games today. Norfolk beating Ottawa 4 to 3 yesterday. Erdo Pettigini drove in his 100th run. Nothing but air. Six strikeouts for Isringhausen. And Isringhausen throwing a nice change. You see it once again. Good location with this pitch. Very good pitch from number 44, Jason Isringhausen. And Bob Apodaca has to be elated with this effort so far. Six strikeouts, three walks. He's only allowed one hit. And Jose Cruz has struck out twice. Breaking ball, one and nothing. Cruz had three hits and four trips yesterday when the Blue Jays were beaten again by the Florida Marlins. Seattle chose this kid third overall just two years ago. 
then this year traded him away one of the better hitters in baseball. He's got good genes. His dad was an outstanding hitter. Two balls and a strike. First of a three game series. Clemens and Acevedo tomorrow night. Robert Person, the former Met, against Dave Malicki Wednesday night. Three and one now to Cruz. We'll have the whole series for you on Sports Channel. There's a Met fan. He said, Look, I'm going to take a couple innings off. I'll be back. At that age, they all take naps right around this time. <laughs> Long holiday weekend. Youngster's been doing a lot of partying. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Something the Mets were a little concerned about regarding Jason Isringhausen last year. Yeah. But, you know, Izzy has been on certain medications for the tuberculosis that he feels precludes him from even thinking about getting too involved in extracurricular activity. And the Mets are hopeful that his approach to the game will be as serious as they want it to be. Well, he almost lost it. That's a wake up call. Ball four, he lost Cruz. So now Joe Carter will come to the plate as the tying run with one out in the sixth inning. He's got a, a very fluid delivery. If he does anything right now on this pitch, it's going to be he's going to overthrow that fastball. But very compact, delivered, step towards the plate, open up, not happy. But you see, when he released the ball, he, his release point was high. It was out of the strike zone. So Carter, who has seen two pitches, he flied to center and he popped to short. That's set up for two on the infield. And the fastball inside. By the way, Baltimore at Florida, they are in a delay. They have yet to start that ball game. Not I unusual. Should, I should say it's a 435 start, so that's the delay. Delayed by batting practice. That's right. <laughs> An infield practice. Two and nothing on Carter. Told you that he's hit the ball twice in the air today, and he will usually hit the ball in the air. Talked about having that uppercut, low fastball, so that he was able to jack out of Sky Dome. He loves that low fastball, at least according to all the highlight shows. Late in the evening when you're watching Carter hit. And that misses. So now Isringhausen, who struck out Green, walks Cruz and is behind Carter 3 0. How about that stat? More than Mark McGuire, more than Cal Ripken, and Barry Bonds, and Jose Canseco. Joe Carter's had quite a career. Watch him now. It's 3 0. Well, Carter, with his next home run, will set the Blue Jays' franchise record. He's tied right now with George Bell. Beach hit 202. One that doesn't count in that category. Postseason, one of the most famous home runs in baseball history. Well, for Mitch Williams to win the 1993 World Series. Downstairs, and now Isringhausen has walked five, including the last two in a row. So Bob Apodaca is going to make a visit. So far, Isringhausen has pitched into the sixth inning. There's one man out. Nobody warming up right now, but Isringhausen with the hat off. Maybe starting to tire. Got a left hand batter, Carlos Delgado, up next. Again, with the bullpen vacant for now. He's up over the century mark now, 103 pitches. And Fran, in a lot of visits like Bob Apodak is making now, is perhaps the biggest part of the idea to just slow him down. Slow him down. It never, right. doesn't even matter what he says, just to slow him down. That's right. Get him to focus, help his concentration, talk to him for a moment, then go back to the dugout. There's some moving around in that bullpen right now. Turk Wendell is up throwing. He'll start to throw in the bullpen. Have you caught pitchers? Who basically were so zoned into what they were doing that when the pitching coach or the manager came to the mound, it basically went in one yeah. ear and out the other? Well, you're happy when they're zoned in. You want them zoned in in a positive fashion. Now you might get somebody that's zoned out, but you think he's zoned in. <laughs> then you have a problem. Well, now Izzy's got a zone in on Carlos Delgado, a 28 home run hitter. 
Two to nothing New York and the pickoff play at second not nearly in time to get Cruz. So it's Cruz at second with Carter at first and Delgado a genuine power threat. Twenty eight home runs this year eighty two RBIs. Olerud made a nice play to rob him of a hit in the second inning and he flied to right in the fourth. That field a step towards right infield looks for two. And it's popped foul nothing in one when right after him, he challenged him a lot of times a, a pitching coach will go out there and tell you go after the hitter don't give in to him. You're giving the hitter too much credit. And I think you know there's so much discussion and so much thinking about the game both by players and coaches that pitchers probably give hitters too much credit and hitters probably give pitchers too much credit. Well that's been one of Bob Apodaca's themes all year feeling that occasionally meant pitchers are afraid of contact. He didn't mind contact at all. Mm -hmm. Just because he's not throwing it. <laughs> and time called as Delgado and a little antsy over Isinghausen's deliberate approach. And Apodaca says, you know, there's a tendency with all staffs, but he's talking about his own in particular, to try to be a little too fine. And to be afraid of the hitters making contact. Oh, Perhaps I have, that's some of what happened with Isringhouse in the last two ABs. Yeah, I agree with that. I think, you know, catcher will talk to a pitcher to go over the hitters, and then you'll be sitting on the outside corner. You expect every pitch to be knee high, you know, don't miss over the plate. Well, you can miss over the plate, and the hitter won't take advantage of it. It's a case of, as I mentioned, pitchers giving hitters too much credit, and hitters giving pitchers too much credit. Padaka, a former reliever with the New York Mets in the 1970s. A good one before he hurt his elbow. And that's popped up. It'll reach the seats foul back behind third. But now advantage is Ringhausen as he's in front of Carlos Delgado. No balls, two strikes. Bobby Apodaca is a guy who feels the fastball is the best pitch. A lot of pitching coaches, you know, you'll hear about the breaking ball, the slider, the curveball, split finger, but Bob Apodaca says he's a believer in the fastball. So he's pumping his ring housing vocally. No balls, two strikes to Delgado with one out. Two to nothing New York here in the sixth. Two men aboard. Did he hold his swing? That's the question for third base of Mark Hirschbeck. And he did. It's one and two. We'll take another look. Did he hold up? Yes, he did. He says the camera always lies about that. Let's sign angles a tough one. So it'll be a one-two to Delgado. Just got a piece of the breaking ball. Delgado grounded out on a curveball, good sharp breaking curveball, and he hit the ball hard back in the second inning. It was a nice play by John Olerud to get Delgado at first base. But if you just tuned in, Isinghausen has thrown a lot of real sharp breaking curveballs. One ball, two strikes, one out. Had a pickoff play at second earlier in this at bat. Cruz had a scramble back as Izzy's throw went to the first base side of the second base band. This time just looking Cruz back. And it'll be a one two. Ooh. And he was hit on the one two pitch from Isringhausen to load the bases. That's a killer right there. The two walks and a hit batsman, and Ed Sprague will be the batter. Third baseman, Ed Sprague. Well, you see Bob Apodaca watching that last pitch and very animated Isringhausen not happy after he hit Delgado with this curveball. 0 2 curveball through an inside. Just got him. So it's Cruz at third, Carter at second, and Delgado at first with one out for Ed Sprague. And Izzy from the windup throws an inside breaking ball. Yeah, he overthrew that curveball. Earlier in his ball game, Isinghausen kept control of that curveball. He's losing command of that and his fastball. 
pressure situation for Isinghausen. Who walks in a hit batsman have loaded the bases with one out. And the fastball inside. Biggest trouble Izzy's been in this afternoon. The Mets still with a two to nothing lead. This could be two. There's one. And a double play. The pitch of the day for Jason Isringhausen. And it gets him out of a heap of trouble in the sixth inning. Still the Mets lead two to nothing. One man with one beer born in the Rockies can refresh thousands. I believe in the perfect pour. Frost brewing. Cold beer, warm heart. I believe that the three most important words on earth are hey, beer, man. That if a vendor can't get you your Coors Light at its ultimate refreshment level, it's a darn shame. And I believe in comfortable shoes. Who knows DSS? We know. Now through Labor Day, nobody has a better price on DSS than nobody beats the Wiz. Now as low as $97. And because nobody beats the Wiz knows how much you love sports, we offer DirecTV's NFL Sunday ticket for half price. Just $79.50. So you'll know what it's like to see up to 13 NFL games every Sunday with digital quality picture and sound. So who knows savings? We know. That's why this Labor Day, everything is on sale. We know. Play ball. At Mets Baseball Heaven, the New York Mets Adult Fantasy Camp. It's worth it. Every penny. A day of baseball and in the tub. Look at that tape. Hi, Mom. You'll take to the field with former Mets players and coaches such as Meon, Jackson, Flynn, Stearns, Zachary, and many more. It's a seven-day season created just for you. For more information, call 1-800-898-METS. That's 1-800-898-METS for Mets Baseball Heaven. Well, Jason Isringhausen threw a big pitch with the bases loaded. This is the old pitcher's delight. Now, Ordonius with both hands fields that ball. Nothing fancy about it, just a 6 4 3 double play. He's one of the best in the game. League leaders, fielding percentage, National League shortstops. He should win the gold glove. There should be an investigation if he doesn't this year. Mm hmm. So to the top of the order, and Carl Everett, who takes a ball from Pat Henkin. At the end of the inning, Bob Apodaca talking to the catcher. Talking about Isringhausen's stuff, I'm sure. Talking about, do you think he's still strong? How's his fastball? How's his concentration? Well, he had to get at least one out with Sprague batting and a two run lead with the bases loaded, and he got the ground ball that gave him two. And so Isringhausen now will probably go out and start the seventh inning because Turk Wendell has sat down at the Mets bullpen. Two and one now on Everett. Brian McRae getting the day off today. And that's fouled the other way. Well, he has waited a long time for results such as what he's produced so far through six innings and not only all through this injury and illness plague year but most of last year too. But he's really overcome some obstacles. Last year was a tough year for him because he was relatively healthy. The yeah. breaking ball gets Everett one man out. And take a look at our mid game recap by Brought to you Third by baseman, Jeep Eagle. Matt That's Frankel. the story for the Mets today and for the Mets in the future. Jason Isringhausen doing the job. How about John Olerud? Did a great shot over the right field wall. We saw Cito Gaston tip his cap to John Olerud. And Butch Husky hit home run number 18. He's got that 10 game hitting streak. So the home run ball supporting Isringhausen as Matt Franco takes ball one from Pat Henkin. 
at 0 for 2 at the plate, but made a nice play defensively against Pat Hinkin in the fifth inning. No cone, the bad hop, whirled and threw him out. Most of what he's done has been as a pinch hitter this year. That's a story here this afternoon. Jason Isringhausen. And the big fella, Butch Husky, sitting next to him. Butch must still be talking about that home run he had. Let's have a 2 0 lead. Pat Hinkin, last year's Cy Young Award winner, pitching for the Blue Jays. And again, Roger Clemens will go for number 21 tomorrow. Clemens, the only 20 game winner in the major leagues, trying to become the first Toronto pitcher ever to win. Cy Young Award, or at least after Hinkin did last year, as Franco laces a single to left. Well, we'll take a look at the way the Mets have scored their runs. All the long ball. Here's John Olerud doing what they wanted him to do in Toronto. Hitting a ball over the right field wall and off the scoreboard. Following in, Butch Husky hits a rope over the left field wall. He caught up with that fastball and juiced it into the bullpen in left field. So Husky hit number 18. John Olerud hit number 17. We're back live. And this is Olerud also flied out to left field. Point I was making about Hinkin. He needs to win the remainder of his starts to become the first Toronto pitcher ever to win 22 years in a row. And Clemens looking to join Henkin as Toronto Cy Young Award winner. <laughs> and he probably will. One on, one out in the sixth. Two to nothing Mets. And the fastball rides high to Olerud. He was two for 31 until he unloaded that home run off the scoreboard. Rojas providing the base runner. Matt Franco, there's one out. Infield at double play depth. Outfield deep and straight away. And the throw in behind the runner, Franco, a Santiago specialty. Funny when you watch Santiago throw, he throws better from his knees. He grew up doing this. So his mechanics are a little bit fouled up when he has to come out of the chute standing up. By the way, the Blue Jays say one of the two catchers will not be with the Blue Jays next year, Santiago or O'Brien. Ball four to John Olerud. And so the Mets catcher, Todd Huntley, will bat with two aboard. That's the first walk issued by Hinkin this afternoon. Catcher Todd Huntley. Yeah, Santiago's really been around as you look at the former Met, Charlie O'Brien, who is a free agent. And he's the pitcher's favorite. So. It's a toss up who they're going to keep. Both of them are free agents, so there's a decision to be made. But the pitchers like Charlie O'Brien. Will Roger Clemens go in and say, I want Charlie O'Brien to stay? We're going to get a pinch runner now. We've got Edgardo Alfonso going in to run for Matt Franco. The Mets have runners on first and second. John Olerud's on first. Edgardo Alfonso's on second. And Todd Hundley. The batter as Matt Franco makes his way to the Met dugout. So Alfonso, who presumably will take over at third defensively, the pinch runner in scoring position with Olerud at first. Hundley won for his last 23. Takes the breaking ball, one and nothing. He took the fastball back in the second inning for strike three. He just missed the fastballs last time up. The ball get in on him. He hit a fly ball to right field. I feel deep and around towards right. The infield looking for a double play. Outside, two and nothing. But nothing doing yet in the Toronto bullpen. Hinkin not happy with himself as he walks away from the catcher Benito Santiago. And Mel Queen going out to talk to Pat Hinkin. And with that in mind, we're going to tell you about Dunkin' Donuts. Once we get that copy, 
Oh, come on. I thought you knew that stuff by oh, bite. I'll, I'll tell you right now, I could tell you all the donuts they have, but, you know, they say, tell them more, tell them more. So we're going to tell them more. We're going to tell them what I feel. <laughs> I love those donuts. By the way, stop by any participating Dunkin' Donuts shops in the tri-state area and try a new coffee culotta. A delicious, frosty, cool sensation in four mouth-watering flavors. Original, mocha, French vanilla, and hazelnut. Check out those shades. Is he wearing trick sunglasses or something? What's holding those lenses up? Hope it's not glue. 2-0 to Hundley. And he had a three-run home run idea, but all he comes up with is air. Talk about custom made. Those things have to fit the bridge of your nose just right. There's going to be some bubble gum on the inside part of those things. Something's keeping those things up. Two and one to Hundley. And that's hit towards the gap in left center. Around third and coming home is Alfonso. Olerud on his way to third. Hundley holds it first with a single and a run batted in. The Mets are leading by a score of three to nothing. Well, they went two out of three in Baltimore against those tough Orioles. They're facing Pat Hinkin today. And they have a 3-0 lead. Here's a big hit off the bat of Todd Hundley. The fastball away. He goes down. He gets it. Hits the ball into the gap in left center field. The Mets score running also on that base hit. Olerud goes to third. So the pinch runner, Edgardo Alfonso, scores easily. And the Mets have runners on the corners with one out. And Henkin thought he had a chance on Hundley at first. Threw about a 90-mile-per-hour heater to Carlos Delgado. Gilkey sees one of those without movement. The Mets could add some runs. Three to nothing, New York. They look for more here in the sixth. Two on, one out. And the breaking ball, nothing in one. Well, the let's go Mets chant back in business. had a little fun over the weekend with Bobby Valentine in the aftermath of some of the comments Pete Hornish made. This couldn't be fun for Gilkey. Six to four to three. A double play. Remember Pete Hornish said Bobby spoke with a forked tongue. Gilkey went into Bobby's office and gave him a plastic fork. Let's add a run and lead by three. Another reason why you've got to believe. Well, Met manager Bobby Valentine and Pete Hornish had a confrontation initiated by Hornish in the lobby of the team's Baltimore Hotel over the weekend after Pete was told that he'd been designated for assignment. Soon thereafter, the Mets completed a deal with the Milwaukee Brewers who get a veteran pitcher for the final month of the season with the Mets paying most of what's remained on Hornish's contract plus getting a minor league outfielder Donnie Moore in the process. Well, Bobby Valentine talked about it on the pregame show. He would like to see closure to the whole situation. Look at there. There's a guy you can't close the door. <laughs> can't get his head in the door. He can't get his head out of the door. <laughs> he was in Baltimore Friday night. Benito Santiago leads off the seventh inning for Toronto with the Mets leading three to nothing and Greg McMichael starting to loosen in the bullpen. Well Pete Rose Jr. Used to play third base. Edgardo Alfonso's got that position the rest of the afternoon for the Mets. Actually Pete Rose Sr. played some third base. Junior is playing there for the Reds today. Came up with his first major league hit in front of his dad. Hit hard by Santiago. He has his first hit of the game. You know, all the limitations on Pete Rose heading to his suspension from baseball. Well, Pete Rose Sr. sitting in the first row at Riverfront 
adjacent to the Reds dugout this afternoon. We'll see his son finally make it to the big league. Yeah, it'd be nice to see Pete Rose Sr. get into the Hall of Fame. Of course, we don't know what was on those written reports that the commissioner's office had in their files. Enough to keep 4,192 yeah. hits out of Cooperstown. And now Greg McMichael continues to throw as his ring house and misses with a fastball to Tomas Perez. Had an infield hit in the second inning. Got a little pop up over the mound that had a lot of backspin on it. Ordonius broke back on it by the time he came in. That ball just spun away from him. Kind of like one of those egg balls when you mm. play stick ball with a pinsy pinky. You know, they're talking about you know, in baseball, they say he's hitting in bad luck or he's hitting in good luck. That was the greatest example of hitting in good luck that you could see. Is he over the 100 pitch mark? And the 2-0 to Perez misses inside. So he labored through the sixth. Two walks and a hit batsman. Got out of the inning when Sprague hit into a double play. But now Bob Apodaca watching intently after a leadoff hard hit single by Santiago. And it's 3-0 to Perez. Good. Well, Bobby Valentine would like to get as much out of Izzy as he could get without injuring that arm. He's thrown a lot of pitches today. Ball four, first and second, nobody out, and this might well do it for Jason Isringhausen. Well, Apodac, I'm sure, talked to the bullpen to make sure Wendell is, or I should say McMichael is ready. There it is. He wants him. He said, nice job, Izzy. We're going to the pin. So Jason Isringhausen should get quite a hand as he departs. He leads three to nothing, although the Blue Jays will bring the tying run to the plate. But Isringhausen will leave, having allowed just two hits, no runs to this point. And the hand for Izzy. That's a nice hand for Jason Isringhausen. He's brought a lot of obstacles in his comeback. So Isringhausen will need some help. So they call the bullpen, and the call is sponsored by Omnipoint. Over six innings, but he walked six, along with six strikeouts. He hit a batter, and with the Blue Jays having two runners on to start the seventh, is he giving up a single to Santiago and a walk to Tomas Perez? Bob Apodaca and Bobby Valentine go to the bullpen and Greg McMichael enters the ball game. But this effort here from Isringhausen is an effort that the Mets can build on and Isringhausen can build on even more so than the W he got the other day. This is extremely important to the organization that he's healthy. They get a healthy Paul Wilson and a healthy Bill Pulsifer. Let's face it a year ago that was the top billing here at Shea Stadium so. A good solid effort from Isringhausen is good for the team, good for the organization, and good in the Mets' pursuit of the Marlins. They're playing later on this afternoon in Florida after batting practice. So Jacob Brumfield will hit for Pat Henkin. Brumfield picked up last season from the Pittsburgh Pirates. Santiago at second, Perez at first, nobody out. Three to nothing, New York in the seventh. And the fastball on the outside corner. From field also a former Cincinnati Red came up with the Reds in 1992 play parts of three seasons for them. Well McMichael has that off speed pitch he needs the ground ball we've seen it many times where he will run that pitch down towards the dirt. Stayed away it's one and one. McMichael last appeared in the game at Camden Yards on Friday. Cal Ripken hit a game tying home run against McMichael in the eighth inning. Greg worked an inning and two thirds that night. Outfield straight away. The infield hoping to turn two. And now a ball and two strikes on Jacob Brumfield. Let's see if you get Brun Brumfield to chase a bad ball down and out of the strike zone. And if he puts it in play, he puts it in play on the ground. Field now 32 years of age. Cubs originally drafted him, then released him. Royals signed him as a free agent. They let him go. 
And now McMichael ahead of ball and two strikes. Off speed, foul back. Got away with a pretty good pitch to hit. That ball was about belt high. Talked about McMichaels. He makes his living off of the off speed pitch. That ball beat him. That, that pitch wasn't thrown that hard. Mm, good pitch to hit, but Michael gets away with that pitch. And again, it'll be a one two. And the fish ball freezes him. Well, Ezringhausen is very happy about it. Brumfield is arguing with the home plate umpire, Second baseman, Steve Carlos Ripley. Garcia. He had his say. He made his way back into the dugout. Now, the pitch before this was a pitch to hit. This is a nasty pitch right there. He gets Brumfield. The pitch before, Brumfield fouled off, and he couldn't get around on that pitch. It was strike three. And take a look at Ezringhausen's reaction. Now Carlos Garcia 0 for 2 with a walk one out in the seventh two aboard three to nothing New York and that's a strike. Garcia like Brumfield coming over from the Pittsburgh Pirates separate deals Garcia coming over last winter. Off the outside corner. Oh, one and one now on Carlos Garcia. And a bouncer that could end the inning. There's one. And a double play. For the second straight inning, the Mets turn a deuce. And in the middle of the seventh, three to nothing, New York. Plus giving up two hits and no runs, six walks, six strikeouts. And he hit a batter. And a good job by Greg McMichael. They appreciate each other's work. As Carlos Baerga takes a ball. Hello. Well, you got your wish. <laughs> Not that easy, though. <laughs> Every once in a while it works out. Paul Quantrill on in relief for the Blue Jays. After Pat Hinkin worked the first six, gave up a couple of home runs, three runs all together. Quantrill originally with the Red Sox then the Phillies and this is his second year with the Toronto Blue Jays last year used mostly as a starter when he went five and fourteen and that's laced right through the middle and Bayerga has his second hit so nobody out here in the seventh Mets get the leadoff man on and we'll take a trip somewhere around Shea Stadium where Matt Lachlan is standing by. Oh, we're down real close to the field Howie for this quick know your neighbor quiz. Canada celebrates Thanksgiving just like we do here in the States except their holiday is the second Monday in October. Do they celebrate Labor Day in Canada. Give you a little time and the answer is yes and in fact it's today but there is one difference. They spell labor L A B O U R in Canada. And of course, we spell it L-A-B-O-R here in the States, but workers in both Canada and the U.S. celebrating this holiday here on Monday. Yeah, but we got Matty working, and so are the Mets of the Blue Jays, and Butch Husky with a home run off of Henkin in the fifth inning gave the Mets a two-to-nothing lead, which they've since expanded by one. Eighteen home runs, three more than Husky hit last year. Bayerga's running, and the broken back rounded a third. Sprague had a hop, skip, and jump away from the lumber, but still gets Husky. Ray Ordonia is 0 for 2, has a chance to pick up a runner in scoring position. And the fastball, nothing in one. Sonia has hit it in the air pretty well the other way in the third. Bounced to short in the fifth. How important is this guy defensively to a ball club? Well, it's hard to quantify in terms of number of runs scored, but suffice to say, he'll save you plenty. One ball, one strike. 
he should become a better hitter as time goes along if he's able to play every day. McMichael has done his job evidently because Brian McCray is on deck as a pinch hitter for New York. That's had Mel Rojas throwing in the bullpen at last look. On the outside corner, one and two to Ordonez. There's McCray. And Rojas, and the watchful eye of Randy Neiman. By Ergen, scoring position with one out. Right side, Garcia takes care of Ordonez, and that moves by Ergen to third with two out. Usual for a pitcher who hurts his arm to become a regular player and succeed on a, on a professional level, whether it's the minor leagues or the major leagues. But a guy who did it was Stan Musial. He hurt his arm. His manager said in a low classification of minor league ball, I'm going to try you as a hitter because you look like you swing the bat pretty well. I believe the manager's name was Dickie Kerr, and he turned Musio into a hitter. So with two out, the hope for the Mets is that McCray can get Bayerga home and increase this three to nothing lead. Hit it hard, but foul. McCray just one out of two this year, at least all around as a pinch hitter. For the Mets, it's his first at bat. In this capacity. Two out in the seventh. Three to nothing, New York. The fastball high, one and one. I mentioned Quantrill was used in both starting and relief assignments last year by the Blue Jays. This year he's been used exclusively out of the bullpen. This is 63rd appearance. to McCray. And that's chopped to spray. Didn't have to jump away from any flying bats that time and has an easier opportunity. And gets McCray. So as we go to the eighth, still three to nothing, New York. New York Mets baseball on Sports Channel is brought to you in part by Aeropostal. Come visit one of our 113 locations nationwide. Our items of the month are graphic T-shirts at two for twenty dollars. Aeropostal, the all-American choice since 1987. So we'll have a ridge of high pressure wow. right here. We didn't get that kind of insight from any of the local weather guys. You know, I did some weather in college. Really? Yeah, I'd, I'd probably be on the Weather Channel right now if not for the injury. Injury? Yeah, rotator cuff surgery. There, you see that? Oh, you know, Allie. I can't do that. Can only raise the old arm about, mm, about that high. Oh, sure, I can handle a sun belt, but anything above Montana, forget about it. This atmosphere is going to be modified. We go to the eighth inning at Shea Stadium with the Mets leading the Blue Jays three to nothing and now Mel Rojas 
will try and pick up presumably three outs and give it to Franco in the ninth. Yeah, this is one of the reasons the Mets picked up Mel Rojas from the Cubs, hoping to regain the form he had in Montreal. His stuff is good. The results have not been as good as his stuff, but if the Mets are patient and he's able to get back to that form in Montreal, everybody's going to be happy. Well, he had a couple of good outings over the weekend in Baltimore. And he'll try to build on that here in the eighth inning, facing first Sean Green, then Jose Cruz Jr., and Joe Carter. Pitcher of record for the Mets, Jason Isringhausen, who went the first six, plus faced two batters in the seventh before McMichael came on and bailed him out with a strikeout and a double play. 0 oh and 1 on Green. Well, and split evens the count. Took a look at Mel Rojas through our spy cam brought to you by Chase. And Mel Rojas, it's funny, is coming out of that bullpen, that's a tough job because when you come in the game out of the bullpen, I don't care if you're a long man or a short man, everybody expects perfection. Tough roll. Rojas behind here, two and one. And an easy play for Ordonez, or at least it should have been, but it hit the lip of the infield. That, that's a tough play, but boy, I'll tell you, he can pick it. He can pick it because he's got quick hands. We've seen him use two hands, and he can use that one hand as good as anybody. Watch that ball stay down. Boom, and he goes down with it. They'll tell you, you get as low to the ground as possible because it's easier to come up than it is to go down. Well, he proved that it's just as easy for him to go down. Look at this. He's expecting a high hop, and then down he goes. Loves the ball. Comes from down under. That's why he's leading the league in fielding as a shortstop. What makes that a tough play after all is the fact that it hit that lip, which is the edge of the grass on the infield. And instead of coming up, it just scooted down, and Ordonez was able to stay with it. See, here in New York, a lot of us grew up where there were cement steps, <laughs> stoops. We used to throw those Spaldines or mm -hmm. fancy pinkies, try to hit the points, hit a <laughs> pointer. That one was a reverse pointer. <laughs> And the fastball two and one. How about at the vet in Philadelphia? Schilling struck out 16 Yankees. Becky Arabu, the losing pitcher, as the Phillies beat the Yankees five to one. <laughs> this Rojas has some good stuff. As you mentioned, how he did a nice job over the weekend. And the 2 2 to Cruz hit weakly off his foot. Here it is, that ball right off the foot. How he said it was hit weakly off the foot. It was hit hard off the foot. <laughs> oh, suck it up. Come on, a little what? A little foul tip. You know what? If the cat, if the hitters had the the uh, plates that the umpires have, told the shoe, wouldn't hurt. But he said you can't wear it. You might not be able to run with it. <laughs> He's one. I mean, you know, they're that uptight about it. Good protection on those shoes. Nothing but air for the third time today. Cruz has struck out. Rojas gets the first two. And Rojas doing the job. Cruz having a Let tough Peter afternoon Joe here at Chase Carter. Stadium. And Rojas striking him out. Going right after the left handed swinger. You can see Cruz pull his head. That's what happens. You strike out three times in the game, you go back in the dugout and start shaking your head and talking to yourself. <laughs> Joe Carter takes a strike on the inside corner. Conversation has turned to deep thought, introspection, and frustration today for Jose Cruz Jr. And now Rojas in front of Carter, no balls and two strikes. <laughs> Blue Jays last in the American League in team batting. And the Mets have held them to two hits and no runs now through seven and two thirds this afternoon. And the 0-2 to Carter. Charging is Ordonez. And a strong inning for.
for Mel Rojas. So Rojas starting to build something for the Mets, who have built a three-run lead. Well, Rojas threw the pitch. It was the ball was hit right at Ordonez. He can catch it with two hands, or he can make the average play with one hand. He's as smooth as silk. Soft hands comes from down under, and they scored six to three. And here's a Bob Apodaca reaction, pulling for that defense and shouting encouragement to Hundley and Rojas. So Rojas sitting next to Ordonez. Those pitchers don't want to let Ordonez out of their sight. And Bob Apodaca also happy about the progress that Mel Rojas is making. And this copyrighted telecast is authorized under television rights granted by the New York Mets solely for the private non-commercial use of our audience. Any publication, reproduction, retransmission, or other use of the pictures, descriptions, and accounts of this game without the express written consent of the New York Mets and Sports Channel is prohibited. Well, the Mets will take at least a three-run lead into the ninth inning. As we go to the last of the eighth, the Mets will have the top of their batting order against Dan Plesac. Came over from the Pirates along with Carlos Garcia and Orlando Merced for six minor leaguers. And it's Perez throwing out Everett one away. A trade was made last winter and after it was done. Everybody around baseball said, oh, my goodness, the Pirates will be lucky if they finish in the National League this year. They've been a great story. They've been a terrific story this year. The Pirates in pursuit of those Houston Astros, and they trail them by two and a half games. Of course, they are a game under the 500 mark, but never mind the standings. I don't think anybody figured they'd be anywhere near the 500 mark, let alone first place in a watered-down division. Mm. Alfonso's first plate appearance ran for Franco in the sixth inning. That's the biggest story in baseball. The Pirates, two and a half games behind the Astros. Look at water, it's starting to drizzle here at Shea Stadium. Yeah, but it's just the way we like it. Oh, yeah? You like that rain, huh? Alfonso lifts it the other way, but it's twisting towards the seats. Remember Arch Fowler, the pitching coach with the New York Yankees, uh, he was playing for the Minnesota Twins and they were in spring training. There's somebody that came prepared. And it was very, very hot in spring training. Sam Neely was the manager of the Minnesota Twins. And the story goes that he got sick of his players saying how hot it was. So he said, the next guy that says it's hot, it's a $100 fine. <laughs> Art Fowler forgot, and he came in from pitch and sat in the dugout and said, boy, is it hot. And Neely quickly <laughs> looked at him. Art Fowler said, but just the way I like it. <laughs> <laughs> Two and one to Alphonse. Oh. One of those days, that 100 would have uh, really hurt. Art oh, much less boy. anybody else making a coach's living. He's Ripley, the home plate umpire. We're talking about those shoes. Well, he's injured right now. He took it. He took it up in the clavicle. Oh! Remember those big protectors, the umpires? Yeah, yeah the outside them. chest. Yeah, yeah. He'd been all right if he had that outside chest protector. What a sound that used to make. When you were catching, you thought the guy blew up behind you when he got hit with a foul ball. <laughs> Two and one to Alfonso. And Garcia scoops the roller for the second out here in the eighth inning. With John Franco First getting baseman, ready John for the Olerud. Mets. John Olerud will be the batter. Franco 33 for 38 this year. Save opportunities. Cito well, Gaston saw something that he couldn't have liked too much earlier in the game when Olerud hit one off the right field scoreboard. He also tipped his hat to his former first baseman. That certainly was one of the classiest acts. I mean, clearly Olerud wants to show in a quiet manner that Gaston was wrong. Gaston would like to prove his point that he's right. And Olerud cracked the ball off the scoreboard and Gaston tipped his cap. One and one now on John Olerud. We saw Plesak over in the American League. Dan was with the Milwaukee Brewers. Olerud two for five against him. One and two now to John Olerud.
Clemens at Acevedo tomorrow night. We'll have that one for you as well as Wednesday's Robert Person against Dave Malicki. Sports Authority game time at 7. First pitch a little after 7.40. Oh, it's amazing. You, you, you're just pulling against the Baltimore Orioles while the Orioles were in Baltimore. And today, Met fans are pulling for the Orioles against the Marlins. That game scheduled to start in about a half hour. The Mets seven out of the wild card at the start of business today. It's Spray throws out Olerud, a one, two, three inning for Dan Plesak. But last licks for the Toronto Blue Jays. It'll probably be up to Franco. beginning of the game I'm not really involved in the game much I'm just kind of watching the game at that point and uh, as the game goes on it gets into the later innings I kind of try to anticipate when our pitchers coming up and I'll go up get loose a little bit and uh, get my stuff ready to go here we are at the home stretch brought to you by New York thoroughbred racing at Belmont Park who's got the bugle oh, what a ride huh? <laughs> you hear them bells again? Yes, I am. Horns, and bells, and whistles. Well, the Mets are hoping for bells and whistles at the end of this game. They got John Franco on in relief here in the ninth inning. Three zip the Mets on top of those Toronto Blue Jays. The first of a three game series tomorrow night, and then again on Wednesday night, the Blue Jays and the Mets will square off. Keep in mind, tomorrow night, Roger Clemens. On the hill for Toronto. An interleague play souvenir from Camden Yards. Well, interleague play has been successful in most parts of the country this year. Radical realignment may be on the menu. Owners meeting coming up in September. I don't know if it's being embraced by all owners, though. Well, we'll go to the ninth inning with John Franco. Hoping to make everybody happy here at Shea, as well as set a new record. He saved yesterday's game to tie his own club record of 33 saves set in 1990. So one more, and John Franco is in the books all by himself again. It's funny, he hasn't gotten the respect that he deserves throughout his career. He hasn't been a guy with a pitcher could blow the opposition away. So three to nothing, New York, as we go to the ninth. Carlos Delgado, Ed Sprague, and Benito Santiago scheduled for Toronto. And the fastball, nothing in one. Delgado, 0 for 2, hit by the pitch. Robbed of a hit by Olerud in the second. Blue Jays with only two hits, both off of Isringhausen. He worked six plus and gave up the two hits, struck out six and walked six. McMichael came on with two on, nobody out. Struck out. Brumfield, the pinch hitter, got Garcia to hit into a double play. Rojas worked a perfect eight, and here's Franco. Two and one on Delgado. <laughs> Broke his bat, and Baerga throws him out. That bat went flying towards the first row of field boxes alongside the Met dugout. Didn't get in there though. Thankfully, that baby missed the fans. And John Franco just Ray. sawed off Delgado's bat. Watch this. Mmm. Now, that wood's got to be some bad wood. He didn't get it really on the hands. And again, the pitch from Franco to Delgado took the big rip and broke the bat in half. So here's Sprague who had what really was the pivotal at bat for the Blue Jays in this game. In the sixth inning, the Mets had a two to nothing lead. The Blue Jays had the bases loaded one out. But Sprague hit into a double play to end the inning. And again, he goes Ordonez's way. 
And now the Jays are down to their last out. And that's the wrong way to go. Ordonius has been brilliant once again this year, cutting his ears way down. Isn't it? Thank you. Worst thing can happen to you when you're on the air. We have cough buttons, but not sneeze buttons. No, we don't. Well, Bobby Valentine has used four pitchers this afternoon. And they're an out away from combining to shut out the Blue Jays. Santiago one for three. Olaru chasing behind first. Oh, Put it in the box. What a play. Olaru ran a long way for that ball. What an outstanding play by John Olaru. Looked like the ball was going to go into the stands. Stayed in foul territory. Did not go into stands. And Olaru made a great play. Cito Gaston looking on. And the Mets with a big victory here against Pat Hinkin, last year's Cy Young Award winner. Now look at Olaru, how far he has to go for this ball. He's wondering, will it go to stands? Bang, he makes the play. And the man cheering him on, Bobby Valentine. So the Mets playing some good baseball. They went into Camden Yards against one of the best teams in baseball. They won two out of three. They beat last year's Cy Young Award winner this afternoon. Tomorrow night, another tough job, but they're up to the task. And Olerud's been waiting for this game all year. He hit a 425-foot home run against his former teammates, and he punctuated the win with a solid defensive play to close out the shutout. Three to nothing, New York. Your <laughs> final score this afternoon here at Shea Stadium in the first of a three-game series. Lots more coming up if you stick around. In the mound here at Shea Stadium, and you get the reaction you got from the crowd today. Yeah, it, it's very nice. I mean, I, I appreciate the fans. I mean, with, without them, I mean, uh, you know, it's hard to do anything out here. And it, it's nice to uh, have them, you know, have them behind me. And, uh, you know, hopefully I can, hopefully they'll be behind me for the next 10 years. That's what I'm hoping for. What's your regimen between the end of this season and spring training? Winter ball, and if so, how much? Yeah, I think uh, you know, we plan on going to Puerto Rico. And uh, I have a, a wedding to attend uh, the middle of December, go home for that. Sean Watson, my best friend, is getting married, so I'm the best man in that. I have to go home for that. And uh, I think after the holidays, if they need me again, I'm going to go back down to Puerto Rico and pitch probably till the middle of January, take a, you know, two or three weeks off and get ready for spring training. You know, uh, you mentioned uh, your best friend. You're going to his wedding. A good friend of yours uh, struggled in the minor leagues. Have you talked to Bill Pulsifer lately? Uh, not lately. I heard uh, the last thing I heard about him is that uh, he was getting moved up to Triple A. I mean, we had the same agent, so I can uh, go through uh, go through them to find out how he's doing. And uh, I knew that he was sitting out for a little bit with a blister on his finger for some reason. And uh, they told me uh, we were in a race, kind of, to get back here. And then when he found out that I got called up, he started pitching again, no matter if it blister or not. And then he <laughs> stopped talking to you, right? So you yeah. haven't spoken to him since you came up. Yeah, I haven't talked to him, but you know, hopefully uh, I can get in touch with him, see how he's doing, and if I can, I can always get messages relayed through our agents. All right, Jason, nice going today. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. That is Jason Isringhausen of the New York Mets, now 2-0 and on the year, our Nissan star of the game, appearing in our Dunkin' Donuts post-game interview. And for joining us, Jason gets dinner for two at the Mid-City Grill, conveniently located in Midtown at 575 Fifth Avenue and 47th Street. The Mid-City Grill features creative American cuisine and fine wines. Three to nothing, your final, a knee slapper of a game. You know, you see a two-hit shutout, and it seems like a pretty clean, crisp, nifty, tidy one. And in fact, as it was played on the field, that was the case. Normally, though, you don't need four pitchers to come up with a two-hit shutout. But Jason Isringhausen made only his second start of the year. So they went to the bullpen in the seventh inning, and they got one solid inning's work out of three separate pitchers, which really is the formula the Mets are hoping for. Yeah, the Mets uh, did it today with these three guys out of the bullpen. You had Greg McMichael, and uh, he did the job coming in and changing speeds. Take a look at those numbers right there. Mel Rojas followed McMichael into the ballgame, and then John Franco picked up his 34th save. So 
things looking up for Mel Rojas and Greg McMichael and things remaining consistent for John Franco. So the bullpen doing the job after Jason Isringhausen left the ball game and Isringhausen threw the ball very well. He picked up his, his second victory of the of the year for the New York Mets. All right. Now the last time Roger Clemens started a ball game in this yard was in 1986. That was game six of the World Series. I don't think there's any further need to recap the events of that night. Juan Acevedo will make his first start as a New York Met tomorrow against Clemens and we'll have it for you on Sports Channel. Matt Lockman carries you the rest of the way on the post game show right after these messages. New York Mets baseball on Sports Channel has been brought to you by your tri-state GMC dealers. By Nobody Beats the Wiz. For state-of-the-art home electronics, computers, cameras, music, movies, and more, Nobody Beats the Wiz. By the Coors Light Wide Mouth Cam. Tap the Rockies with a smoother pour. And by your New York, New Jersey, and Connecticut Nissan dealers, who remind you that life is a journey. Enjoy the ride. Welcome back to Shea Stadium, everyone. A good afternoon for the Mets as they shut out the Toronto Blue Jays by a score of three to nothing. Jason Isringhausen just a few moments ago speaking with our Howie Rose and Fran Healy about his performance this afternoon and a pretty good one at that. Six plus innings gave up just the two hits did not allow a run little touch of wildness as he gave up six walks while also striking out six but a big improvement over his first outing last Wednesday when he was roughed up in the matinee by the San Francisco Giants. So Izzy improves to two and zero on the season. Todd Hundley was behind the plate this afternoon calling for the pitches from the talented right-hander. I had a chance to speak with Hunley just a few moments ago and asked him what his evaluation of Isringhausen's performance was coming on the heels of that so-so outing against San Francisco. Uh, you know, Izzy threw the ball well today, obviously. Um, you know, we were talking about uh, he didn't hit many of his spots today. We got away with some uh, some mistakes, but uh, I think that's the thing he learned today, that you got to hit your spots. and. Um, Key situations he did. Uh, majority, you know, he was just up in the strike zone, and they have some aggressive hitters over there that were going for it. But uh, when he had to make his key pitches uh, to spread to get the double play, uh, he did, and uh, that was the key the whole game. Early on, it looked like his curveball was back to 95. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, his curveball is just my throwing for strikes, period, because uh, it's such a good one. When hitters see it, they're going to give up on it right away, and they're going to take it. Uh, if he can throw it for a strike, boom, we got him. But uh, it was he's throwing for strikes early on. Got a little bit tired later and uh, wasn't able to get it over, but uh, that's when he started spotting his fastball. And that's just the adjustments that uh, we had to make today uh, on the fly. And once he was taken out of the game, the bullpen does the job. McMichael gets out of trouble in the seven, then hands it over to Rojas, who hands it over to Franco. Yeah, worked perfect today. They, uh, you know, Matt comes in in, in a uh, very tough situation, gets a ground ball. Mel comes out there, one, two, three, and Johnny, one, two, three. So it, uh, you know, worked out perfect today and, and uh, put W in a win column. And now a little pressure placed on Florida. I know you're watching the game, curious as to what they're going to do, but now they've got a little something to worry about, even though they have the cushion. Yeah, they do. Uh, it's, it's that time of year. So, uh, yeah, we're going to sit here and watch a game uh, all afternoon and, and see what they do, see if they can handle the pressure now. <laughs> well, Florida handling the pressure right now. They have a 3-0 lead in their contest against the Baltimore Orioles. But the Mets winners this afternoon, John Oleru with the home run. We'll be back with more after this. Pan Am now serves New York to L.A. nonstop, three times a day, from only $126 each way. Call 1-800-FLY-PAN-AM. This is the Sports Authority post game show. The Mets have now won three straight. A shutout performance this afternoon as they open up this three game set against Toronto with a 3 0 victory. Now, Norfolk down on the farm was eliminated from the International League playoffs today. And so the Mets have announced that several players will be joining the team in the September call ups. On the pitching side, Takashi Kashiwata and Joe Crawford will be back with the Mets. All of these players expected to join the club by tomorrow. Also being recalled, Alberto Castillo. Three infielders got the call. They are Jason Hartke, Sean Gilbert, and Roberto Pettigini, who was the MVP of the International League this season. And outfielder Carlos Mendoza getting the call from Binghamton, where he was batting 382, one home run, and 13 runs batted in. We'll have more from Shea when we come back. Is he the winner this afternoon? The 
Mets beat the Toronto Blue Jays by a score of three to nothing this afternoon. The Blue Jays limited to just two hits. There were a number of heroes for the Mets this afternoon. Welcome back, everyone. This is the Sports Authority Post Game Show. Among those heroes, John Olerud facing his former mates for the first time. He had his 17th home run of the season in the fourth inning, and that gave the Mets a one nothing lead. They also scored solo runs in the fifth and sixth. In the fifth, it was Butch Husky with a home run, and then in the sixth, Todd Hundley had an RBI base hit. All of that supporting the pitching of Jason Isringhausen, who improves to 2-0. and And after Izzy left the ball game after pitching six-plus innings, the bullpen did the job. Greg McMichael came on and got the Blue Jays down quite easily in the seventh, and then perfect eighth and ninth innings from Mel Rojas and John Franco, respectively. And the Mets go on to the victory. Right now, let's check out the out-of-town scoreboard. It's brought to you by Western Union. The Yankees beaten by Kurt Schilling and the Phils this afternoon, 5-1. to one. Hideki Arabu takes the loss. Schilling with 16 strikeouts of the Bombers. Elsewhere, Kansas City over Cincinnati by a score of 7 to 4. Pete Rose Jr. made his Major League debut, came up with a base hit in his first game. Elsewhere was Cleveland over Pittsburgh by a score of 7 to 5. Sandy Alomar and Manny Ramirez with home runs for the Tribe. In 10 innings, Montreal edges Boston by a score of 4 to 2. Elsewhere in interleague action, the Chicago White Sox in St. Louis. They're in the eighth inning. The Pale Hose lead by a score of 4 to three. Meanwhile, on the north side of the Windy City, it's the Cubs in Minnesota tied at six in the sixth inning. Sammy Sosa with his 31st. Houston trailing Milwaukee in the seventh inning by a score of three to one. Baltimore on a Cliff Floyd three-run homer leads Baltimore by a score of three-nothing early in Miami. Coming up later on, San Francisco is at Oakland. Detroit pays a visit to Atlanta where Greg Maddox looks for his 18th. And then San Diego is in Seattle. Meanwhile, Colorado taking on Anaheim coming up at 11 o'clock here on Sports Channel in case you missed this game or you want to see the recap in 30 minutes flat at Sports Channel Light with your host Bramante Bryant. Tomorrow night we'll have the game for you game two of this three game set. It'll be Roger Clemens on the mound for the Blue Jays. He'll be opposed by Juan Acevedo. All the action begins with the Sports Authority game time at seven o'clock. The first pitch comes your way at about 740. Payback day for John Olerud. He says take that Cito Gaston. Olerud's home run gives the Mets the lead, but Gaston said, hey, no hard feelings. Nice shot, John Olerud, as we'll let bygones be bygones. Meanwhile, nice job by Jason Isringhausen, and Izzy says, thanks, Greg McMichael, for getting me out of trouble in the seventh inning. And Olerud put this game away with a fine running catch in foul territory to end the contest, making Bobby Valentine's Day very enjoyable indeed. Well, that'll do it, folks. We'll see you tomorrow night. This has been a presentation of Sports Channel, a tradition of excellence and innovation in regional sports television.